السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam His entire household, all his companions We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them all And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of us and to bless our offspring those to come up to the end may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant ease to every one of us and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make easy for us whatever difficulties we may be going through my brothers and sisters in islam it is indeed an honor to be here at this beautiful venue the zaid bin muhammad family gathering and to be able to speak to you this evening on a topic that will bring about lots of contentment if we were to take heed because it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from the words of the blessed messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and every one of us. Similarly, what we do need to know is when the Almighty created us, we had no choice. None of us seated here can say, I had a choice to come onto the earth. It was imposed on us by the supreme deity, the one in absolute control, the one who has created the entire creation. He decided that he wants us to be created too. And this is evidence enough to prove that we owe him. We owe him because some people go through difficulties and they think, I don't want to live. But in actual fact, you have to live because the one who made you knows why he made you. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it absolutely clear that he is the creator. He is the sustainer. Right at the beginning, if you were to start the Quran, and I'm sure all of you, if not most of you would know, the first verse of the opening surah or chapter of the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen All praise is due to Allah Rabbul Alameen The term Rabbun refers to the creator, nourisher, cherisher, sustainer, provider, protector, curer, the one in whose hands lies absolutely every aspect of existence. He is known as Rabbun. So he is Rabb of Al Alameen. He is the Lord of the worlds. All the different creatures from the beginning to this day and right up to the end. He is the Lord. He takes care of the ants just like he takes care of human beings. <laughs> Nothing that walks on earth, nothing that walks on earth or that treads the earth, except that its sustenance is upon Allah. Don't worry about sustenance. Allah will sustain you. Allah will provide for you. Allah will give you just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the bird that flies suspended in the air. لو أنكم تتوكلون على الله حق توكله لرزقكم كما يرزق الطير تغدو خماصا وتروح بطانا. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says, if you trust Allah سبحانه وتعالى in the proper way, He will sustain you just like He sustains the bird. He will look after you. Now some people sit back and they relax and they say, okay. Allah says he will look after me just like he looks after a bird. So let me just sit back and wait. I can be lazy. I can be anything. Whatever is written for me will come. Wallahi, the hadith is not complete. The hadith says, meaning what we've spoken about so far, we still need to speak about the end of the hadith. It says that bird leaves the nest with an empty belly in the morning. It goes out and comes back at the end of the day with a belly that is filled. Where it got its food from? The help of Allah. But it worked hard throughout the day. Many of us work very, very hard. We work hard 
Allah will give you, Allah will provide. Keep on calling out to the owner of sustenance. The difficulty is sometimes the glamour of the world overtakes us in a way that we don't realize the owner of the money that we're looking for is actually the maker who made us. So when we get closer to him, we become wealthier people. Subhanallah. I will say or I will recite a few verses through the course of this evening's lecture that will prove to you that if you want sustenance, you need to get closer to Allah. You need to get closer to your maker. He will provide for you. He will grant you. Subhanallah. So we all find that in our lives as we are born and we grow up, there are difficulties. Our parents face challenges to look after us. Our parents find it difficult. Our mothers have spent sleepless nights. Our fathers as well. I hope the fathers are not just lazy, sitting back, relaxing and leave it for the mum. You need to take care of the child as well sometimes. You need to give the mum also, sometimes you need to give the mum a little bit of sleep and say, don't worry, tonight I'm on guard. Subhanallah. Do we do that? MashaAllah. I hope it will happen by the will of Allah. May Allah make it easy. But we feel the difficulty. It's not easy. It's exciting when someone is expecting and we get so happy. MashaAllah. I'm expecting. May Allah make it easy. May Allah grant you a birth that will be, inshaAllah, easy. It won't be free of difficulty, but Allah can make it as easy as possible. However, once the child is born, it's a whole new ball game. Your life changes. You go through hardship, sleepless nights. You might struggle in terms of finances because now you have a child. But Allah knows that that is his plan. That is what you are on earth for, to strive within the obedience of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that... By the time you leave the earth, you have already developed a link with the maker whom you are going to return to. And you have lived a life such that the baton you passed it on to the next generation. Yesterday, I was speaking to a group of young men and I was telling them, you know what? It would be quite simple to divide our lives into three because the Prophet ﷺ says that A'maru ummati ma bayna sittina ila sab'een. The average lifespan of the members of my ummah between 60 and 70 years. Say for example, 60. Let's take the lower figure. The first 20 years, the previous generation is teaching you how to live life. Do you realize that? The first 20 years, your parents, your teachers, whoever else, they are teaching you how to live your life. The second 20 years, you are living your life. Subhanallah. So now, I'm graduated, perhaps 20, 25, I'm living my life, I got married, I have my children, what am I doing? I'm enjoying a little bit here and there. You clock 40 years. After that, the last 20 years, you are now preparing the next generation to live a life. It's amazing how these 60 work. Now, this is not from the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa this division. This is just from our experience. We will notice that the first portion of your life, People of the previous generation are teaching you what life is all about. The middle of it, you are living your life. The end of it, you are busy teaching other people how to live the life. It goes to show you where Allah says, <laughs> Remember when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when your Rabb, told the angels, I am creating a Khalifa on earth. What is the meaning of Khalifa? One of the meanings is those who come one after the other. That is all one of the meanings of Khalifa. That means I came, my parents taught me, I led a life, I teach my children, I leave, they lead their lives, they teach their children, they leave, and so on. It's amazing how this is the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I will face challenges. I was created in order to face the earth. And the earth is not simple. It is filled with obstacles. Just like if you were to enroll into a beautiful college that has a very high name in terms of education in your country. It's not going to be a walk in the park. Subhanallah. It's going to be difficult. You need to be facing examination after examination. And test upon test. And guess what? The more qualified you become, the more difficult the tests are. At the beginning, they are very easy, simple tests. They give you an interview. They ask you, what do you know about medicine? And you say, well, not much. They say, well, that's why you are here. Come, we will teach you. 
As they teach you one concept, they test you about it. When they teach you 20 concepts, they test you about 20 concepts. Then you go into the practicals and then you become a doctor after you have passed the final examinations. So when it comes to the earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, I put you into this exam room. You will go there. You will learn what it's all about. By the time you clock maturity or puberty, you are now called mukallaf. You are responsible. You are answerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What will we do? Allah says, Surah Al Ankabut. Allah says, Does man think, do you think that it's sufficient for you to say we believe and you will not be tested? In fact, we have tested those before you as well in order to determine and distinguish who from amongst you are truthful and who are false in their claim. People say sometimes, why? I'm a believer. Why do I have so many tests? Why do I have so many difficulties? Why do I have so many hardship? I can tell you why, because you are in the school. You are in the exam room. You have undertaken that Allah is one. You have believed that Allah is one and you believe this is the messenger. Allah says, okay, come. You really believe? We're going to test you. So how will we test you? You believe Allah is the sustainer? You believe Allah is the curer? You believe Allah is the all wise, the all knowledgeable? You believe he is the Lord of the worlds? Okay. So when we make you sick or ill, may Allah grant us cure. Say, Amin. When we make you sick or ill, we want to see what you do. Will you employ methods that are against what we have taught or you will do that which is permissible? You go to the doctor, you may want to read some Quran, you may want to look after yourself. There is something called Mu'awwidat. Mu'awwidat meaning those chapters of the Quran whereby if you were to read them, you would be protected from the devil and his progeny. You need to read them morning and evening. It is like medication. If you have high cholesterol and the doctor tells you, you need five milligrams of cholesterol every single day at this time, what will happen if you miss it? If you stop it, your cholesterol levels will go high. The same applies. If Allah tells you to protect yourself from the devil, you need to read the last two surahs of the Quran or you need to include with it Ayatul Kursi, which is a verse of the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah. And if you don't do that, don't blame anyone when you become ill or sick. Remember this. It's a test from Allah. You need patience in order to endure. Now one might be asking, this is an introduction to a beautiful topic. When it was advertised, I saw it said there, patience and prayer. Sabr was salah. That's what it said. Sabr was salah. And I'd like to add to that as well, that the importance of being generous, the importance of giving. So why did I start this way? To show you that we will be tested. He came onto the earth in order to just enjoy without being tested. No, you will enjoy with the tests. Allah did not say you're not going to enjoy, but there will be pockets of difficulties that will overtake you at times so difficult, so hard that you will need fine good words to encourage you. You will need people around you to give you some hope. And this is why in Surah Al-Asr, if you take a look at the short surah, a beautiful verse at the end, Allah says, let me mention it. Allah swears an oath by time. Allah says, I swear by time that all mankind is at loss. All mankind is at loss except for those who believe and do good deeds 
and they encourage each other or they remind each other they constantly remind each other regarding the truth and they constantly remind each other to bear patience wow wow subhanallah constantly if i see you you're in a difficult time difficult situation you are my perhaps son or daughter or spouse or whoever else you may be to me just a normal person it is my duty if i'm a good believer to tell you don't worry everything will be okay it's fine it will be okay turn to allah don't lose hope continue we're all struggling we're all going through challenges keep on going don't give up those words are so powerful my brothers and sisters use them often encourage people at your workplace muslim non-muslim whoever it is give them a word of hope because when you give them a word of hope allah will create hope in your own life and allah will give you so many doors and avenues of goodness and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless you in a million and one ways so this is why if you were to take a careful look at Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 155, Allah says quite clearly, we will test all of you. You know, it's like a college. It reminds me of a college where, you know, someone in charge is telling you every week you're going to have a test. And every month you'll have a slightly more difficult test. And every year you're going to have a major examination. If you graduate, guess what? We're going to make it more difficult for you. If you pass, we're going to make it more difficult for you. You're going to get the following year more difficult tests. So don't think that once I pass the one test, that's it. I'm going to sit back, relax. Wow, you will get a prize at the end of your secondary school. Perhaps you get a certificate with all A's. How happy are you? Your parents are happy. You are happy. Your family is happy. And you can get a brilliant job or a placement at a university of your choice because you have all A stars or distinctions. Was it easy? No. I spent sleepless nights. I worked hard. I gave up my iPhone. Imagine, because I needed to study. I gave up my games, my Facebook, my Twitter, my Instagram, because I needed to study. Wallahi, the exams of Allah are far more important than those. So if you pass one, the next one will be more difficult. Allah says, Walanabanuanakubishai what a beautiful verse surah al-baqarah verse number 155 and after that allah says we will definitely test all of you you know the term in the arabic language is emphasized it is called a ta'kid Ta'kid means emphasized in a powerful way. There is an extra lamb. There is a double noon, which means definitely, definitely we are going to test you. Do not think that you are going to get away without a test. You have to be tested. What are you going to test us with? Allah says, Shay'im min al khawf. Part of fear. You might be scared sometimes. Fear might overtake you. Whatever fear it is. Fear is of so many different things. I leave that to you to think about. So Allah starts off by saying, Min al-khawf, wal jur you will be tested with hunger, so many different ways. Maybe there might be food, but you may not be able to eat it, or there may not be food, and you will not be able to eat. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to appreciate the food we have. And this is why one of the best things that I have heard is the fact that this is the year of giving in this particular nation. Generosity and giving. When you have eaten, don't waste. Make sure that whatever is left behind is given to those. And when I say left behind, you know, I visited Far East Asia and I remember entering a restaurant and I learned something. I remember the name of the restaurant. It was Tupai Tupai. That was the name. How do I remember it? Because I, I said to myself, there are two pies in here. So two pies. 
That's the name of the restaurant. Some of you might know it if you've visited uh, Malaysia, Singapore, perhaps the Philippines, etc. So they said that you pay so much for a buffet and we will charge you by weighing your plate when you are leaving to see how much food you have left behind. For every 100 grams or something, charge so much. I cannot remember the figure. And I was so impressed because I told myself, Subhanallah, we have a bad habit. What is the bad habit? Wallahi, it's a buffet. I took my plate, I fill, I fill. I'm not worried, I'll just fill it. Why? It's a buffet, that's why. And I filled it full like a mountain, you know, Subhanallah. And what did I eat? One or two things and I left it and I'm gone. What did you take it for? I paid for it. You paid for it. That does not justify the wastage. This is why congratulations to the rulers who are trying to conscientize us about wasting. Rather than wasting, give it away. Make sure that you give, subhanallah. Going back to the verse, Allah says, Allah will test you with hunger. We started with fear and hunger. And la lack of wealth or loss in produce or loss of life. All these things are mentioned in this verse. Then Allah says, give good news to those who are patient, those who bear sabr, those who are understanding the control that Allah has of entire creation. I was asked once, if Allah is so merciful, why do people die? The child asking me the question had a beautiful question. If Allah is so merciful, why do people die? Because to him, death is the end. So I said, my son, if you believe, you will realize that it's the mercy of Allah that actually makes us die. Allah does not allow you to taste pain beyond a certain point. And this is why if you are inflicted with some harm or you are hurt or injured, beyond the point it becomes numb. Beyond the point you become unconscious. And beyond the point you lose your life. Because Allah does not want you to feel pain beyond a certain point. And on top of that, my son, and I was talking to this young boy, I told him, I said, do you know what? When you have worked so hard throughout the year, what happens at the end of the year at your school? You have a prize giving. Would you love it if you were called up on the stage and you were given your prize? He said, obviously, I would love it. Is that not a big gift? Yes, it's a very big gift. I said, so Allah tells you that while you're on earth, we will test you again and again. Whoever passed those tests, we will call them up for the prize. You know, there is a hadith which speaks about the day of prize giving. When I say the day of prize giving here, I'm referring to the day of judgment and what happened thereafter or what will happen thereafter. I'm sure you've heard of a narration where the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says there are seven categories of people who will be granted a special shade. The day that there will be no shade besides that shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sab'atun yudhilluhumullahu tahta dhilli arshihi yawma la dhilla illa dhilluhu. And there are seven categories. What is that? Those are all prizes of those who endured. They were patient. They were forbearant. They practiced restraint. They tried their best. They constantly sought the forgiveness of Allah, Allah will call them out on the day of judgment and Allah will say, you know what? You tried hard. We tested you. We tested you with the toughest of tests. But that's because we love you. The hadith says, Inna Allah idha ahabba abdan ibtala. When Allah loves a slave, He tests him. He tests her. If you have problems, my brothers and sisters, remember, I do too. He does too. Everyone else does too. Of a different nature. We have issues. We all deal with it differently, depending on our closeness with our maker. This is why the verse says, give good news to those who bear sabr, to those who are patient. Give good news to those who understand they need to develop their link with their maker. And the hadith also says, The greater reward will be with the greater test. Apply this to the school situation. It's true. When you have a simple question, what is one plus one? I think they give you half a mark for getting it right. But when you have a long question that took you half an hour to solve, they give you 20 marks. Do you agree? 
The same applies with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When He gave you a test that lasted five whole years, six years, you had difficulty, you struggled, you went through one thing after another, financial problem, social problem, health problem, spouse problem, every other problem you can think about, Allah will give you 90 out of 100 based on that. And then you graduate. When you, how do you graduate? You have to get to the prize giving. Where is the prize giving? On this side of life or that side of life? It's on that side of this life. <laughs> what that means is, there is a life that is absolutely eternal that begins the day this life ends. So this is what I was explaining to the young lad to tell him, you know what? You want to get to the prize giving without going to the school on that day, without climbing on the stage. You cannot, you cannot achieve Jannah without dying. If I were to ask you today, how many of you want Jannah, put up your hand. Everyone will put up their hand, right? The whole crowd. Who wants paradise? Everyone. But if I were to ask you, who wants to die right now? I think we all just look down. I don't want to die. But you want Jannah? Jannah is on the other side. May Allah make it easy for us to understand. This is the blessing of Allah. This is the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Live your life to its extent. Allah chooses when you will die. You are not allowed to harm yourself. Allah says, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِكُمْ رَحِيمًا Do not harm yourself. Do not kill yourself. Do not commit suicide in any way. For indeed, Allah is very merciful upon you if only you realize. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us realize this. So these are the blessings of Allah. We need to be patient. And that patience we will be able to achieve when we develop a link with Allah. Now, what link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You will notice many times in the Quran, many places, Allah links two things. He links what is called sabr with salah. So he says, bear patience and establish your prayer. I can read for you a few verses. The first is verse number 45 of Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah says, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ Seek help through two things. Sabr, and that is simple translation is patience, but I will get to the longer translation inshallah in a few moments. Seek patience through sabr. Patience. Sorry, seek help through patience. Seek help through patience and prayer. What's the connection between the two? Let's go back to the hadith of Abu Malik al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Sahih Muslim is, narrate, is recorded to have said that at-tuhuru shatrul iman. That's the beginning of the hadith. He speaks of cleanliness. We spoke about that today in Jum'ah in the Friday lecture, that cleanliness is half of your faith. It is a huge portion of your faith. You need to maintain cleanliness, not only that which is physical, but cleanliness in terms of a clean mind, clean in terms of your relationship with Allah, clean in terms of your relationship with the rest of the creation of Allah. Your character and conduct needs to be clean. And you need to maintain cleanliness in every aspect of your life. But that hadith continues to say, salatu nurun. As-salatu nurun. The prayer, when we speak of salah, we are talking of the five daily prayers. And you can add to it that which is voluntary. Allah says that salah is a light. And then after that, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, obviously these are his words, but the message is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, As-salatu nurun. And he says, thereafter, when it comes to sabr, he says, was sabru dhiya. Sabr, patience, is a light, but a different type of a light. One might ask, what's the difference between nur and dhiya? Let me tell you. Go back to the Quran, to see the difference. Allah says, Amazing verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, It is He who has made the sun diya. And He has made the moon noor. Two words used to refer to light. 
The difference is one is calm and serene. It comes with a beautiful atmosphere and an ambience that is different. That is noor. So when you fulfill your salah, as salah to noorun, salah will bring about lots of comfort. It is called qurratul ayn. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, I have been granted the coolness of my eyes in salah. So when you fulfill your prayer and you do it, you've washed yourself, you have a beautiful place and you start off Allahu Akbar, amazingly, there is a beautiful, serene feeling. It is something that is filled with contentment, just like the light of the full moon when you are to look at it. It is white. It does not have a burning in it. It is cool. You can look into it. It is absolutely beautiful. You achieve contentment, beauty, calmness, and so on from your prayer. But when it comes to sabr, sabr means patience. It also refers to restraint. Let me take a moment to explain to you the three categories of sabr. Sabr means that patience, normally we just use the term patience. But when you have to fulfill the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the strength that is required to do it is also known as sabr. I am bearing sabr because I need to fulfill the laws of Allah. There are two major types of laws. One is the do's and the other, the don'ts. So for the do's, I need sabr to do them. To get up early morning to read Salatul Fajr, subhanallah, is not a joke. Get used to it. It becomes your habit. You will open your eye automatically at the time of salah because you're used to it. Your body has this computer that is amazing. <laughs> That's the gift of Allah. But if you're a person who sleeps any time, any day, you're not worried about it, it's going to be really tough. You put one clock, two clocks, three clocks, and each one of them you press snooze, snooze, snooze. And still, when you snooze, you lose. So you've lost your salatul fajr. That's what happened. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. But you need the strength to fulfill this instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is known as a sabru ala ta'a. To bear patience regarding the obedience of Allah. And then you need a different type of restraint, which is also included in the meaning of sabr. Restraint to abstain from the prohibitions of Allah. The don'ts. I see something, I want to do it, but it's in the displeasure of Allah. So I say, no, I will stay away from it. To stay away from it, you need power. You need restraint. You need sabr. And the third type of sabr is patience that is required to accept the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has destined something for you, we know it is predestined. When that happens, we have to surrender to the decree of Allah. Allah took the life away of someone close to you. It has to happen. He told you he will do that in the Quran. He said it, I'm going to do this. That's what he said. So Allah will do it. We have to lose our loved ones because we have to go. Don't worry. If you do good deeds, Allah says, Allah gives good news to those whose family members follow up in that goodness. Allah says, we will gather you together later on. Don't worry, you're going to meet each other. You can gather in paradise. The condition is, you need to do good deeds. You need to try, you need to believe, and you need to, you know, there are people sometimes they don't believe in the hereafter. I remember once I was sitting on an aircraft, and I was sitting next to someone, and I meet a lot of interesting people, mashallah, tabarakallah. And this brother tells me, you know what, you guys are crazy. I said, what do you mean? You don't even know me. And you're calling me crazy. He says, you believe that we're going to hell. I said, sorry, what religion do you belong to? He says, I'm an atheist. I said, you know, with all due respect, obviously we have a live and let live policy and mashallah, we, we will coexist by all means. But I want to tell you, why are you worried about it when you don't even believe in the hereafter? Me, he was quiet. <laughs> I said, okay, have you thought about it? If you are worried about what I've said about the hereafter when you don't even believe in it, it means deep down, perhaps there is something in you that is telling you, hey, what if this guy is telling the truth? Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us. May Allah open our doors. Like I say, wallahi, my brothers and sisters, 
We have a live and let live policy. We will coexist. We will have our differences. We have to have the differences. These differences must not make us become violent. They must not make us spread hate. They must rather make us engage one another in positive discussion so that we can be enlightened regarding the decisions we have made in our lives. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to make the best decisions based on sound knowledge. So I was speaking about the light of the sun and the light of the moon and the fact that this one is called the ya and that one is called nur. So Allah says with the salah you achieve the nur and with the sabr you achieve the diya. Diya is like the sun. When I need to abstain from something, there is a bit of an energy required. It's a little bit of heat. I see something I really love, I really like, but there is a certain power that is required for me to stay away. Whereas when it comes to salah, that is a very positive energy. I just say Allahu Akbar and I'm so calm. I'm so relaxed, subhanAllah. Imagine going onto the ground and putting your forehead or forehead, however you want to pronounce it, putting it onto the ground and saying, Oh my maker, you are the highest, you are the greatest. Oh you who made me, I declare your praise and I declare that you are the highest. Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. That's what the Muslims say. When they go down into prostration, it is a position filled with humility between you and your maker, direct. Imagine you go down and you are picturing this to say, I'm in front of my maker on my you know, prostration on all seven bones. And I'm there saying, Oh, my maker, you are the highest. That is such a beautiful feeling. This is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, As Salatu Nurun. Salah is Nur. It has in it beauty. And then this verse comes to be understood. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu sta'inu bis sabri wa salaam. Inna Allah ma'as sabirin. Verse number 153 of Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah says, O you who believe, seek assistance, seek help. Help regarding what? Your issues, your problems, whatever you have. The assistance you will get will be through two things, two major things. Sabr and Salah. Bear patience and I've explained to you the three aspects of it. And fulfill your prayer. Why fulfill your prayer? You develop your link with Allah. You develop your link with your maker. I tell you, the more patient you are regarding abstaining from prohibitions, the more sweetness you derive from this beautiful salah. When a person has stayed away from prohibitions, he will definitely or she will definitely be able to achieve a beautiful sweetness and a taste of that prayer such that he or she will want to pray every time and more than just the obligatory prayer, even that which is over and above the obligation. Voluntary. I enjoy it because now I know the value of this prayer. So you have a problem, bear patience. But together with it, build your link with Allah because He has the solution to your problems. And what is the solution to my problems? Wallahi, the owner of that solution is Allah. If I need wealth, He will provide. If I need anything, He will provide. You know, it's amazing how we take a look at certain acts of worship. A byproduct of those acts of worship happens to be things that we are looking for in our day-to-day -day lives. You know, when we seek forgiveness of Allah, it is one of the ways of earning sustenance, wealth. If I have a blockage of, say, my wealth, I feel as a human being something is wrong. What is wrong? I don't know, I cannot earn. Or oh, I'm earning, my money is getting wasted. I don't understand. My brother, my sister, perhaps you are doing something prohibited. Perhaps you are engaged in haram. Your money is being wasted. There is no barakah, no blessing. The Quran teaches us this, going back to the story of the Prophet Noah, may peace be upon him, Nuh alayhi salam. Allah says that Nuh told his people, and this is in Surah Nuh, قُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا وَيُمْدِدِكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ Amazing verse. Allah says, Nuh alayhi salam told his people, I told them to seek the forgiveness of Allah 
for indeed he is most forgiving. He will open the skies with beneficial rain as a result. And he will grant you wealth and children that you so desperately want. Amazing. Now, it is wrong for us to say, I am praying because I need money. I don't have money. Today we were taught, if you pray, you will have money. Or if you ask Allah's forgiveness, you will have money. So I am only seeking forgiveness to have money. The intention is wrong. Because that wealth, that sustenance, those children are a byproduct. Byproduct means you will seek the forgiveness of Allah because you are remorseful regarding what you've done. You will pray because you consider it an honor and an obligation unto Allah. And Allah says, as a result of that, your door will be opened and we will start providing for you. Slowly but surely. Again, there was a youngster once after my speech. I spoke about forgiveness and so on and how Allah will open your doors if you were to pray and if you were to be uh, seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly. So three days later, the boy comes to me and he says, you know what? I've been praying for three days. I haven't missed a prayer, but I'm still struggling with the same problem. I told him, my son, how old are you? He says, I think it was 16. I said, for a few years, you have not been praying. Now you expect three days dedication, every problem will be resolved. That's not it. If you were not studying for so many years, suddenly you study for three days and you want to get a doctorate, a master's, whatever. It doesn't happen. It will come with hard work. Dedicate yourself. Perhaps, you know, fulfill it for a year and you see things start opening one after the other. My brothers and sisters, when you go through difficulty, sometimes you think it is bad for you, but Allah knows it is the best thing for you. I give you an example. People who have health problems, financial problems, family problems, any other issues that you have. You have an issue, you're trying to get married. You don't know if that marriage is actually going to work. I know of people who have fought to marry someone. They marry them, they have a child or two and there is a divorce. And then they say, I should never have fought for this. But you didn't know. Perhaps Allah created an obstacle in order to keep you away from it. This is why there is something known as istikhara. Istikhara meaning seeking the guidance of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala in a certain matter. What do we say at the end of that supplication? We say, Oh Allah, if you know that this is not good for me, it's not good for my deen, it's not good for my faith, for my present, for my future, then keep it away from me. Create a barrier between that and myself. So suddenly, many barriers are being created, but you still say, my istikhara was positive. It was positive. You don't know. We have a misnotion. People think when you read this dua of istikhara, you will see a dream. That's not true. You may, but 90% of the time you won't. It will either be facilitated, made easy, or made difficult. Read the meaning of that dua and you will know how you will get a response. Oh Allah, if this is good for me, it is good for my deen, my dunya, my life, my future, my akhirah, my hereafter, then make it easy for me and give me blessing in it. So suddenly the doors start opening. The next day you get a phone call. The following day someone tells you a good word. Then someone else tells you, my brother, I heard something nice. It's all positive signs and things are facilitated. So the point I'm raising is we will all go through difficulties, problems, issues. Why are they better for us at times? Ajaban li amril mu'mini. The Prophet ﷺ says the affairs of a true believer are amazing. Because when goodness comes in his or her direction, he or she is thankful. It's better for him. And when difficulty and hardship comes in his or her direction, he or she bears patience. That is better. How many of us, in all honesty, we don't really pray properly. We don't really obey the instructions of Allah in a proper way. We're weak. And we say, I'm weak. I'm a human. You know, I remember uh, one man was telling me that every time I remind a friend of mine about the wrong that he's doing, he keeps, he keeps on saying, make dua for me. Make dua for me. Brother, stop your alcohol. Make dua for me. Brother, stop uh, the drugs. Make dua for me. Brother, stop the pornography. Make dua for me. Well, together with dua, you need to do something as well. Yes, dua is powerful. Continue making dua. 
especially like for our children, for those whom we don't have sometimes absolute control over, one of the most powerful elements and aspects is dua. You want something, make dua. But I want to tell you, when Allah exposes you to something that you need to make a dua for, He's showing you who is the boss. He's showing you who is in charge. And He brings you to Him. Like I was saying, many of us, we're not ideal. But don't you agree that after we've had a big problem in our lives, we become better in terms of our relationship with Allah? You have a problem, you have a difficulty, you have a sickness, and suddenly you go to the masjid for the first time in so many weeks, and then you become regular, and then you lay, raise your hands and you say, Oh Allah, I'm crying to you, help me. I seek forgiveness for the evil I've done. Wow, subhanallah. What happened? Had it not been for that difficulty in your life, you perhaps would not have called out to your maker. So don't you see how it was a gift for you? Allah says, oh, I love you. Look at this worshiper of mine. The hadith says Allah becomes so happy with the repentance of any one of his worshippers. So you made Allah happy, but Allah brought you in. Allah roped you in through difficulty. Had it not been for that hardship, perhaps you may not have come through. So this is why that sabr and salah, they come together. They come together. You will bear patience regarding the difficulties you are facing. But at the same time, make sure that for the solution of those difficulties, you turn to salah. Where do we get this from? The Prophet wasallam. In several narrations, mention is made of how إِذَا حَزَبَهُ أَمْرٌ فَزِعَ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ When things used to overtake him, when a difficulty used to come in his direction, immediately he used to make haste towards prayer, salah. That is the best of creation, the most noble of all prophets, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. If he used to resort to prayer whenever he had any form of issues or matters that were of concern. What about us? How many of us, you have a problem, first thing you do, you wash yourself and you cry to your maker, oh my maker, help me. Try it. He will help you. And continue. And don't say, why are you not listening to me? He heard you. He knows. He knows when the time is right. He knows what is better for you. Sometimes you want a deal, a business deal, and you're making dua to Allah. You want a job. You're asking Allah, oh Allah, my job. Allah knows, perhaps you might get that job, and as a result of some relationship you develop at the job, you might lose your marriage. So Allah says, hang on, that job is not good for you. We're not going to give it to you. And you're busy saying, oh Allah, why are you not giving me the job? Trust Allah. He knows. Trust your maker. He knows what he's doing. He will give you the right job. Sometimes a person earns too much. They end up in the clubs, they end up drinking in the pubs, they end up wasting their money, they end up doing things that perhaps are immoral and so on, because they've got money. So Allah says, for you, I'm going to keep you at a job where the, perhaps the salary... You don't get to this particular issue and problem. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. So. If you take a look at Surah Taha, I was making mention of the rizq. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْطَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا لَا نَسْأَلُكَ رِزْقًا نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُكَ وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلتَّقْوَىٰ Verse number 132, Surah Taha. Allah says, Instruct your family to fulfill the obligational prayer and be patient upon it. Now this is the patience to obey the instruction of Allah. Allah says, we are not asking you to sustain us. We are not asking you sustenance. We will provide for you. You fulfill your prayer, we will provide for you. So my duty is to fulfill the prayer for the sake of Allah. As a result of that, I will be provided for. I will be getting sustenance and I will be leading a content life. My brothers and sisters, these are just some of the benefits of this beautiful patience. Do you know that in order for us to earn paradise, we need two important qualities. The first quality is taqwallahi. 
Taqwa Allah, he means the consciousness of Allah. You need to be conscious of your maker. I need to be conscious of the fact that I'm going to return to my maker. Number one. Number two is husnul khuluqi. I need good character, good conduct. If I have good character and good conduct, I can earn paradise through that. How or why? Let me explain. Taqwa or consciousness is connected to your link with your maker. And character and conduct is connected to your link with the creatures of the same maker who made you. So Allah made me, right? And Allah made all of you and Allah made the animals and Allah made everything else. My relationship with Allah needs to be correct and my relationship with the rest of the creatures of the same Allah who made me needs to be correct because I need to acknowledge that the same. So there's definitely some rights that need to be fulfilled between us. It's amazing. This is why my brothers and sisters, it's important for us to bear patience when it comes to the development of your character. When the Prophet ﷺ told a young lad who asked him for advice, لا تغضب. That means don't get angry. He says, okay, give me more advice. He says, لا تغضب. Don't get angry. He says, okay, give me more advice. He says, لا تغضب. Don't get angry. I mean, imagine if you were to ask me or I were to ask you a question, give me advice, and you just told me one word, once, twice, thrice. I think we would get irked or irritated. Perhaps. When it comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa it only showed the importance of controlling your anger. Control it. Many of us in the home, we tend to explode. Explode, literally. Why? Because they are vulnerable. You know when you go to work, how many hours are you at work for? A few hours in the day. It's easy to put up a show to pretend whom you are not. But the Prophet ﷺ says, خيركم, خيركم لأهلihi. The best from amongst you are those who are best to their ahl. Ahl here includes primarily your spouse. And thereafter your family members. Why? The reason is, they see you 24-7. They see you in a condition. If your wife or your husband or your children or your parents can bear witness, those who live with you can bear witness that you are a lovely human being, then you are indeed a lovely human being. Because they know you, as we would say, inside out. They know everything about you. This is why my brothers and sisters, will you make an effort to develop the beautiful characters and conducts that need to be developed Within the home? Will you improve the way you speak to your spouse, your children? Will you develop your relationship with others, those who are Muslim, those who are not Muslim? I've been faced with so many emails and so many requests of people who have embraced Islam and they say, but why sometimes some of the Muslims don't really accept us? What do we offer a person who declares shahada? When someone declares their shahada, they enter the fold of Islam, they revert to Islam. We say takbir, don't we? And then everyone says, Allahu Akbar. And that's all. After that, you go away. The same brother, mashallah, he's purer than you because he accepted Islam. Now he wants to marry within your family. What do you say? No, 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 not at all. What does he know? He doesn't belong to my city, my village. He doesn't come from my country. He doesn't belong. But hang on, is that what Islam taught? Are you not ashamed of yourself? Subhanallah, the day he declared his shahada, you were the one who said takbir so loudly. You should have just said, my brother, I love you. I declare that I love you. Really, we are equal. Subhanallah, you didn't need to scream and yell like a hypocrite. When you did not have the feeling in your heart. Bilal ibn Rabah and his brother, there is a story mentioned about their marriage, how they were from Africa, but they were married. Subhanallah, within the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because of their value, because of the fact that they were believers, the Prophet peace be upon him speaks about character and link with the maker. If those two are in order with an individual, 
Let them get married. Subhanallah. I know I diverted a little bit to mention this because it requires a lot of restraint. And it requires discipline. And it requires a link with Allah. And it requires lots of knowledge to be able to embrace one another. To be able to save yourself from racism. Many of us think that we are not racist. But when the test comes to us, we fail it dismally. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. And may that not happen to us. My brothers and sisters, you know we have difficulties amongst ourselves sometimes. You have a problem. You have an issue. Someone did something bad to you. Maybe your husband. Maybe your wife, your children. Maybe someone you worked with. Maybe someone on the street. I promise you, as a Muslim, you need to consider forgiving them. Why? Because Allah says, sometimes when you forgive and when you embrace and when you bear patience, it is more beneficial for you. It is better for you. Those who bear patience and forgive, indeed that is the best of affairs. The best thing you could do. It's difficult. It's not easy. Someone might say they're doing bad to me so much. They're doing bad to me so much. How can I keep forgiving them? You have a point. But consider this. If you forgive, there is a greater chance that Allah will forgive you. And if you are patient, there is a greater chance Allah will be patient with you. Amazing. And sometimes if you don't forgive, the price you shall pay might just be far greater than if you were patient for a while. I give you one example. There was a sister who contacted me some time back. She has three children. Her husband unfortunately had an affair with someone. And she told me that I need your help, but please don't tell me to be patient. Okay, you need my help, but please don't tell me to be patient. So I told her, my sister, what did he do? He did this, he did that. Wallahi, no justification. That was bad, it was unacceptable, it was terrible, it was really wrong, it was major. Has his life changed? Has he admitted? Yes, he's admitted. Has he said, I'm sorry? Yes, he has. Has his life changed in any way? Yes, it has. But I can't forgive him. Okay, no problem. If... His life has changed. If he's become very transparent now in his relationships, if you are satisfied that he has made an effort, and if you are seeing within him that he's becoming a better person, then I would suggest you consider the following, that if you want a divorce, just because of a mistake that was made, perhaps you might become a statistic. But if you are, after seeing all this positive change, Remember, I'm saying this because I don't encourage people to just bear patience and bear patience and bear patience. And the guy keeps on harming and harming and harming and harming. No, no, no. There is a limit beyond which nobody can tolerate it. My brothers and sisters. Sometimes the difficulty is with the sisters. But a lot of the times it's with the brothers. Anyway. So, what would happen is, I told her, perhaps if a divorce happens, you may be a statistic whereby... He will get married again. He's a happy man and he's excited and perhaps someone much younger. And you know, there is no shortage, etc, etc. And I said, what will happen to you? You will have gone away. Now you're going to struggle because you're going to fight for maintenance. You're going to fight for something else. You, people will look at you. There is a stigma attached. Unfortunately, you know, I was asked recently about divorced women. And what is the encouragement Islam has given about marrying those who are divorced? And I said, look, you don't need to look at my life or the lives of the companions for this. You can go straight to the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. All his wives were previously married besides one. Did you know that? Subhanallah. All his wives were previously married besides one. Aisha radiallahu anha. The rest of them were previously married. So there is a very high status. There is nothing wrong. If a person's been through a divorce, they are still as pure. The most pure of all chose that type or those types of women. Subhanallah, widows and divorcees. So my brothers, 
Let's not have a misunderstanding to say someone who's divorced is actually someone who is cheap or they're low or they have lost their value. No way. Sometimes they will add value that you would never have imagined. Go back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Take a look at how he used to miss Khadija bint Khawailid radiallahu anha beyond her death such that there is a hadith that makes mention of the fact that he used to keep a good relationship by giving some gifts to some of her friends later on. Amazing. Who are these people? These are the friends of Khadija. And he used to send to them something sometimes. He used to remember them sometimes. So going back to what I was saying, I told the sister, look my sister, if you bear patience and you try to increase your link with Allah, Sabr and Salah. You need to make sure that you develop your link with Allah. That will occupy you. It will keep you in the right track. And bear patience. Look at the man. Remember Allah. Thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will find within no time things will improve. You know what? A few years down the line, I can't recall how many, but I got a message from this brother saying, My brother, I want to tell you that the advice you gave my wife was so brilliant. We went through the most difficult time, but today our relationship is far stronger than it ever was before the problem we had. Look at the gift of Allah. Allah says it clearly. Whoever is prepared to bear patience and forgive, that's the best thing you could do. Subhanallah. It's the best thing you could do. There are so many verses that speak about the reward of those who bear patience in this world and the next. <laughs> Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recompenses those who bear patience in an unlimited fashion. Unlimited. In this world and the next, you will see the fruits of your patience. But if you're not patient, impatient, what will happen? You taste a little bit of it. I am not saying that you need to endure oppression. I'm not saying that. I am saying that when you do good by being patient, where you can be patient, Allah never ever throws the reward of those who do good. I want to give you the most beautiful example. Yusuf alayhi salam, the Prophet Joseph, may peace be upon him. I'm sure you know the story. It is amazing. Allah says in the Quran, نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصِ We are relating to you the most beautiful of stories. That was the story of Yusuf, the Prophet Joseph. The whole chapter is named after him. And it is the only story that is found in one place from the beginning to the end. At the end, you know the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam. What did they do to him? They tried to harm him. They wanted to kill him. They put him in the well. They did this to him. They did that to him. They did so much. They literally plotted against him. They tried their luck against him. They threw him in the pit. He got up. Someone sold him. Someone bought him. Someone tried to lure him to committing a sin. They jailed him. And he continued, subhanallah, bearing patience. How many things? Plenty. One after the other. So many things. At the end, Allah made him a powerful person. He was in authority. And finally, his brothers came in. He was so delighted. But obviously, he needed to deal with this matter. He had a good heart. How many of us have a good heart? It's not too late. You can develop your heart. You can develop the qualities of your heart. You can eradicate the hatred you have. You can work on the jealousy, the envy, the ill feeling. People get jealous very quickly. It's becoming more and more common. You have a beautiful car. You have, subhanallah, a beautiful robe. People become jealous. I can't believe it. It's becoming worse. Work on these qualities. Look at Yusuf alayhi salam. He asks his brothers. Allah makes mention of it. Who 
قالوا أئنك لأنت يوسف قال أنا يوسف وهذا أخي قد من الله علينا إنه من يتق ويصبر فإن الله لا يضيع أجر المحسنين سبحان الله Allah says, he asked his brothers, do you know what you did to Joseph and his brother when you were ignorant? Look at him blaming the devil. Look at him blaming shaitan when you were ignorant, which means I excuse you. Do you know what you did to Yusuf and his brother? They immediately thought to themselves, it's impossible for anyone to know what was done to Yusuf and his brother unless it's him himself. They looked at him and they said, what's the possibilities of you being Yusuf? Are you Yusuf? He says, yes, I am Yusuf. This is my brother. Allah has favored us. That's the word. He didn't say, I hate you guys. I'm going to fix you guys. I'm going to show you guys. I'm going to make sure I'm the leader today. I'm going to jail you. I'm gonna... That's what we would do, I think. A lot of us would do that to our own spouses, let alone someone else. We would do it. I'm going to fix you. I'll show you. I'm going to make you regret your decision, etc, etc. We have bad words. So what happens? We suffer as a result of our own plot. We struggle. We suffer. Because we have a bad plot. Don't do that. Try to find within your heart the soft spot that will look and learn from the stories Allah makes mention of. He doesn't talk about it for nothing. He talks about it because He wants you to learn a lesson from it. So He says, Allah favored us. You know what that means? In one sentence, he told them, no matter what you did, what you tried from the beginning to the end, look at how Allah gave me as a direct result of your action. Had you not plotted against me from the beginning, I would not have been here. Sometimes we lose a job. We get so upset, but we don't realize Allah wants to give you a better job. Only after five years, you're going to say, Alhamdulillah. You might start your own business and it might flourish. And Allah says, look, you were so upset when you lost the job. Look at where you are today. So be happy. My brothers and sisters, Ista'inu bi sabri wa salah. So long as you are bearing patience and your salah is in order, nothing evil can happen to you. No, it cannot. Yusuf alayhi salam says, I am Yusuf. This is my brother. Allah has favored us. For indeed, whoever is conscious of Allah and they bear patience, Allah will never waste the reward of the, those who do good. Those, indeed those who are conscious of Allah. Conscious of Allah meaning you fulfill the obligations as best as you can. You abstain from the prohibitions as best as you can. You seek the forgiveness of Allah as best as you can. That is the consciousness of Allah. Consciousness of Allah is to create a barrier between you and Allah's displeasure by fulfilling His commands and staying away from prohibitions. That is the consciousness of Allah. It is called taqwa Allah. So whoever is conscious of Allah and bears patience, Allah will not waste the reward of those who do good. Imagine Allah calls them muhsineen. Allah says they are the ones who do good. Who is, a good, who is a doer of good? A doer of good is a person who has taqwa and sabr. How do I know it? Because it is in this verse and it is in several other verses as well. Allah will not waste your reward. When you were patient, Allah will give you. The problem is, my brothers and sisters, in patience we become impatient. You know what that means? We say, okay, I'm going to forgive. And after a while you say, oh Allah, I'm still waiting. You are becoming impatient. That's why the hadith says, يُسْتَجَابُ لِأَحَدِكُمْ مَا لَمْ يَسْتَعْجِلْ Beautiful narration. When you make dua to Allah, you call out to Allah, Oh Allah, give me, Oh Allah, grant me. Allah says, we will give to all of you for as long as you are not impatient. So the Sahaba radiallahu anhum asked a question, What is this impatience? What do you mean impatience? He says, for one of you to say, I called out and I called out and I called out, but Allah didn't answer. That means you became impatient. Allah knows. When I say, Oh Allah, I'm looking for a job. Firstly, I need to develop a link with Allah. You know, when you know someone, when you are close to someone, you say, 
Give me a job. You don't have a job? Come, come, come. I'll give you double the salary. Take it. Why? Because I'm friends with you and you're a big boss. Allah is bigger than anyone else. So when you have a good relationship with him, what are you looking for? Ta'arraf ila Allahi fi rakhai ya'rifka fi shidda. The Prophet ﷺ clearly says, get close to Allah during times of ease. The problem with us is we only get close to Allah during times of difficulty. Well, that's good. It's good. But there is something better. What is better? Times of ease. You have no problem right now. You have a job, you have a wife, you have a husband, you have children, you have a car, you have a house, you have a good salary, you have everything else, you have peace, you have serenity, you have... Get close to Allah now. You know why? The day difficulty is about to come in your direction, Allah will be closer to you. Allah will get closer to you. So this is why we say, when you lose a job, I'm giving you practical examples, right? And you say, oh Allah, give me. Wait, be patient. It might take a while. But if you do isti'jal, if you try, if you are impatient, you may not get it. Because you are saying, oh Allah, I'm calling out to you for the last 40 days. You did nothing. Astaghfirullah. That is an insult to Allah. Don't do that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create for us an environment that makes it easy for us to fulfill our salah. It's not easy to be in good company. It requires a lot of restraint. Sometimes you have glamorous company, company that is bubbly, but with them, you don't ever think of your obligations unto your maker. Then you have a small problem. That problem can become big if you forget your maker in totality. But if you continue to obey Allah, you try your best, that doesn't mean you don't enjoy. Some people think when I have a good relation with Allah, it means I must just sit at home and that's it. I'm not allowed to enjoy anything. I cannot, I must just sit. Then I'm a pious person. No. Pious people can also enjoy, subhanallah, within the limits of Allah. The only difference is they enjoy in such a way that they don't compromise their obligation unto Allah. If I go for a party or a picnic, I don't compromise Allah's instruction. When it comes the time for prayer, I pray. Because I know I need to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I, once I finish my prayer, I go back and I'm sitting and talking and so on. I don't backbite. I need to be patient. When we backbite, we are sowing a seed of evil. That will grow a lot of evil that will come back to us. But when we fulfill prayer, when we are charitable, when we give that which is good, in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are sowing a seed of goodness. It will grow in goodness and come back to us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So my brothers and sisters, so many verses of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how it is better to bear patience. I hope you've understood this. I want to spend a moment to speak about a difficulty that people are facing today. We live with one another, in our families, in our homes. And sometimes we get irritated with one another. We make life difficult for one another. Sometimes you're making life difficult for your daughter, for your son, for your spouse, for your daughter-in-law perhaps, for your son-in-law maybe, for someone. You're making life difficult for them by doing what? By imposing on them things, by living with them without considering them. You need to bear patience because there is a great chance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can create a different type of difficulty for you in a short space of time. And this is why when you do evil, there is a chance that that evil will definitely come back to you in some way or another, even if you are to harm an animal. Subhanallah. Moments ago, we were speaking about giving because you know that this is the year of generosity and giving here in the UAE. And I'd like to let you know something interesting. I always mention this because I love it. Each time I speak about it, a new aspect of it dawns. So the hadith is in Bukhari where the Prophet ﷺ speaks about a man who was thirsty and he went into or he went down a well 
now I presume at the time the wells were such that you had to go down to get things you know if there is a bucket with a rope it will go down if there isn't you have to go down so he went down and he drank some water because he was extremely thirsty it was a very hot day it was a dry day and a dry season and he came up when he came up he saw a dog he saw a dog let's be honest if you saw a dog right now what would you do <sighs> am i right am i right it's a reality we would run away hey, hey move move go this way that way many of us maybe not all of us many of us would run away a dog is coming from one corner we are already walking through the other corner that's what would happen so you can imagine this relation and we do know there are more rules and regulations pertaining to our relationship with a dog than there are when it comes to sheep and goats and animals that we can eat perhaps and maybe a cat or a kitten etc dogs there's a few more rules and regulations in islam regarding your relationship with a dog however what is absolutely interesting is this hadith speaks of a dog there was a dog what happened the dog was panting and it was licking the sand from thirst it was a sign of thirst very thirsty dog so the man looks at the dog and immediately he felt mercy what did he feel he felt mercy but guess what he didn't have a container or a bucket he thought to himself this dog is as thirsty as I was before I went into the well I was fortunate enough to be able to go down the well the dog will not be able to go down the well so let me go down the well for the dog subhanallah for who not for who for what for a dog so he went down the well and he realized you know the best thing I can use to fill the water is my own shoe my own shoe so he took out his leather sock it's called a hoof in the Arabic language he took it out he removed it he filled it with water he came up and he took the time he made the effort to actually take that and to give the dog some water to quench the thirst of the dog amazing subhanallah Allah loved the deed so much that Allah forgave his sins Allah forgave his sins I ask myself a question how come this wasn't another human being why wasn't it a cat why wasn't it something sweet like a parrot or a bird that was feeling thirsty so it came onto my hand and I said boo, 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 boo. you know drink some water something sweet why is it a dog it is a dog I believe in order for us to learn a lesson that there is a reward in everything that has a life so if there is another human being who might be totally different from you in faith in inclination in ways in so many different ways in dressing whatever else totally different from you for you to reach out to a human being is far more important than for you to reach out to an animal although the latter is also important what that means is Islam teaches us to be kind to animals definitely but Islam teaches us to prioritize like I've always said if you have a, a man drowning and next to him there is a dog you don't start with the dog you know you start with the man and this time I gave an example of a man because the last time I gave an example of a woman and I heard someone saying unless it's your mother-in-law may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us that's not on that's not on at all so my brothers and sisters what we need to know is we will save both the intention is to save the dog and the man but we start off with the man save him we go back we take the dog and we save the dog so if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us that he delivered this man from sin or he forgave him should I say as a result of compassion towards this animal why can't we be kind to one another why can we not be kind why don't we reach out to one another become generous donate and give and try not to waste 
the excess, learn to reach out to one another. I promise you, you will achieve the forgiveness of Allah. If Allah forgave the man for a dog, what do you think he's going to do if you were kind to an, a human being? Subhanallah. Common logic. This is amazing. And we should talk about this. We should speak to one another about it. Because many people think I'm a Muslim, that's it. I'm, I'm a good Muslim, I, I just look down and carry on. I ignore the rest of the world around me. Yes, one thing is lowering the gaze. But it doesn't mean when something is happening that requires your assistance, you use the excuse of lowering your gaze to allow them to suffer. And you say, I was lowering my gaze, I'm a good Muslim. What are you talking about? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and ease. My brothers and sisters, we all ultimately want paradise, don't we? Without patience, you won't get paradise. Because patience is the correct answer to most of the tests that Allah tests us with. The correct answer is patience. Imagine a standard answer, patience. How do we know this? Listen to what Allah says, Surah Fussilat, verse number 35, speaking about paradise. وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا ذُو حَظٍ عَظِيمٍ Who will attain this beautiful paradise? It will not be attained except by those who were patient. It will not be attained except by those who who will have a great portion from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This patience that you endure, you will definitely see a reward for it. Yusuf alayhi salam, I told you, he forgave. If he did not forgive, what would have happened? Have you thought of that? If he did not forgive, what would have happened? Well, I can't even say because he did forgive. But I can imagine the story would not have ended well. Do you agree? It has ended in such a beautiful way where Allah says he forgave them. Then he called his parents. Then his parents came up. And even the father, when the children said we did wrong, you know what he says? He says, I will seek Allah's forgiveness for you. Allah will forgive you. He is most forgiving, most merciful. But he was patient with them. We need to be patient with our children. They may do things that perhaps are not ideal, but that's what we're there for. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be patient with us. Similarly, many times people say things to us. People spread rumor about us. Every one of us, without exception. Someone somewhere behind your back or even sometimes in your presence, they will say things that are not accurate about you. They will say things that are hurtful. They will lie about you. They will say things behind your back that are absolutely derogatory, that are unacceptable. What does Allah say about that? You have to go back to the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was known as Afdalul Khalqi wa Akramul Rusuli. The best of creation, the most noble of all prophets. And people said that he was a womanizer. They said he was after money. They said he was after power. They said he was just after the authority he wanted. And he was a greedy. A'udhu Billah. May Allah safeguard us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا يَقُولُونَ وَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكِ قَبْلَ طُلُوعِ الشَّمْسِ وَقَبْلَ غُرُوبِهَا Verse number 39 of Surah Qaf. Allah says, Be patient regarding what they are saying. They will continue saying things. Be patient. Don't get upset. And if you want to help yourself, then you need to declare the praise of Allah constantly. Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. Praise be to Allah. Glory be to Allah. I glorify you, O oh my Maker. I declare your praise, O oh my Maker. You are the greatest. Oh my maker, etc. And it will help you to overcome rumors that are being spread about you behind your back. Don't turn towards them. Don't incline towards them. You need to bear patience. You need to seek Allah's help. But this verse shows us that people will talk about you, especially when you're a good person. 
They may say things. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the best. They said the worst things about him. But they were just a handful. What happened at the end? At the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna kafayna kal mustahzi'een. O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we have safeguarded you. We have sufficed you against those who would like to mock you. They won't be able to harm your reputation. The people can do what they want. They can say what they want. Your reputation is intact. Because you praised Allah, you were patient. You fulfilled what Allah wanted. Same applies to us. Obviously on a totally different level. But if you are patient, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant you the best of this world and the next. He will protect you. Your name will be purified for you by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If not in this world, then in the next. Look at Aisha radiallahu anha. What happened to her? She was accused of so much, but Allah cleansed her and Allah purified her. And Allah revealed verses speaking about her purity. Radiallahu anha. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to cleanse our hearts regarding one another and to cleanse our hearts regarding the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We need to develop a beautiful, clean heart and we need to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tested us in every way and we need to pass that test. My brothers and sisters, there is a lot that can be said. But I've spoken this evening about sabr and salah and giving. Giving. And I hope that we've benefited from what I've said. This evening, or should I say this afternoon, I visited a group of children. And we spoke about giving. And I explained to them in a way that I felt was the best when you speak to children. Later on, when I uploaded this talk, someone told me that I think you need to tell the adults the same thing. So in two minutes, I will speak to you about the benefit of giving. We always hear, when you give, you get, right? When you give, you receive. We hear that a lot. Zakat is actually referred to as alms to the poor and needy or charity. Generally, it is a small percentage, perhaps two and a half percent. Allah calls it a habba. Allah says, the example of those who spend in the good cause of Allah. And the cause of Allah is any good cause. For the pleasure of Allah, any good cause is called the cause of Allah. Those who spend is like the example of a seed. The example of a seed. So I want to ask you, when Allah asks you to pay your zakat, for what percentage is it? Perhaps, perhaps two and a half percent, okay? In most cases, it is two and a half. If there is farming or mining, maybe the rules do change slightly, but let's speak about the general public. Two and a half percent. And it is a seed. When you eat fruit, what percentage of the fruit is a seed? Say I have an apple. I'm eating an apple. How much of the apple do I eat? 98%, 97.5%. 2.5% seeds. What do I do? I leave it. What do I do with it? Well, if I'm sharp enough, that seed, I don't eat. I give it back. To where? To where it came from. Where did it come from? It came from a tree, a farm. So what I do is I take the seed. If I could be bothered to put the seed back into the soil to look after it, it will grow. Who ate the apple? You ate the apple. The whole apple. Yes, the whole apple. You ate it. But a small seed, you left it. You put it back into the earth. What happened? Allah, through His power, caused that to grow and to give you how many apples? Thousands. You now have thousands of apples. But it started off with one apple. Are you following? The same applies to any other fruit. Look at the pears. 
Subhanallah, you have the pear, you eat it. Who ate it? You ate it. How much of it? All of it. But what I left was just the seed. Wallahi, the same applies to your wealth. If you want, when you give your charity, you ate your wealth, you ate all of it. What you gave was a small seed. Allah says, Kamathali habba. It is the example of a seed. It's so insignificant. Two and a half percent is so small. Give it. It is actually meritorious to give more than that. And what will happen? It will go down. And as you water it with good character, good conduct, لا تبطلوا صدقاتكم بالمن والأذى Don't ever destroy your charities by bragging and being foul-mouthed. No, don't. Be good. And Allah will bless you in a million ways. You find the tree will grow and you will have lots and lots of wealth. This is the example that we gave to the children. And I'm letting you know that when you sow that seed by giving, you shall receive much more than you gave by the will of Allah. So let this be a year of giving. Give as much as you can and continue even beyond this year. For indeed, you will reap much more than you have sown by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.